Okay, so greetings everyone. Stephen Donaco here for Social Chrysalis. Welcome to our very first uh, permutations roundtable. Uh, I'm so grateful for having all you come and join us. Um, this is uh, this is the first uh, debut uh, feature that we're doing through the Social Chrysalis platform. And those of us you see uh, who are on screen right now are uh, faculty members of Social Chrysalis. And we're gonna be uh, talking about and taking your questions as well later uh, around uh, the subject of discerning human evolution in the midst of, of COVID-19. So that's our topic. Uh, I'm, so I'm going to do a couple of brief introductory things and then uh, we'll get into the panel discussion. But before we do that, I'd like to invite Sharon Maloney, who um, is a, one of our faculty members who has a course called Activate Your Female Power uh, to do a quick uh, centering um, exercise. So Sharon. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm going to invite us all, if we feel comfortable, to close our eyes or just let your eyes gaze softly. And bring your awareness to your breath. Flowing in and out. And become aware of your body wherever you're sitting or standing or lying, perhaps. Feel the sensations in your body. And I invite you to come into that still center, deep inside. That place of connection, of groundedness, of coming home to yourself. And I invite you to bring your awareness to your heart and feel the beating, feel the love that is in your heart that is who you truly are. And then feel that love rippling down through your body, down into the earth, our home, our mother. And then feel the resonance and the reciprocal response from Mother Earth back up into your body. So with, the, with each inhale, you can imagine sending your love down into the earth. With each exhale, imagine Mother Earth's coming, love coming up into you. Feel her blanket of protection. Feel her gravity holding us. Feel our interconnection, our intimate interconnection with her body. And then I'll invite us to imagine the torus of our heart radiating out beyond our local time and space to connect with one another. I'm here in Australia and I send my heart's torus and its vibration out across the, the oceans and the continents to reach you wherever you are. And I invite you to do the same. Send your heart's radiant smile, its energy, its unique signature right out and feel those energies meeting in that place, that sacred place of connection. We are truly all one. Feel 
feel the vibration of that spiritual force field that is wrapping around the earth, uniting us across time and space, bringing us all into that oneness, that present moment connection. And it's from that present moment connection, that connection of love and goodwill, that we will embark on our conversation and our exploration today of COVID-19 as an evolutionary driver, considering what wants to emerge, how is the evolutionary impulse showing up inside each one of us to make a contribution to our collective well-being. And so holding that field, that space, that connection, I am able to take a nice deep breath. And then exhale and release. And then when you're ready, bringing your awareness back into the here and now and opening eyes, being fully present. And I'll hand back to you, Stephen. Great. Thank you so much, Sharon. Much appreciated. Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, this we're, we're doing this for those who have, have just come in a, mo a few moments ago. We're doing this... Uh, this round table, it's called Permutations is the name of the series. Uh, we're doing this on Zoom uh, webinar. So it's a little bit different from a typical Zoom meeting you may have been in uh, because uh, the panelists are, the, the, those of us on screen and then attendees uh, can see us and hear us. So you're all in the audience. And then um, there's a Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. If you do have a question for us as we get into the panel discussion, go ahead and submit your question in the Q&A and then also indicate if you'd like to come on screen because then we can bring you in and see you and hear you that way. Otherwise, I can take the questions directly just from text and then ask them to the panel. So uh, the Q&A uh, function again is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then uh, my, uh, we, we're going 90 minutes uh, uh, today. So uh, look forward to having really a, a very rich discussion that every minute's gonna be valuable and uh, very full. So without further ado, I'm just gonna start with a, a brief, a very, very brief primer on what conscious evolution is. So uh, I assume many of you who've come in to hear uh, know at least of Barbara Marks Hubbard and her work. Uh, she is basically the, the mother of the field of conscious evolution such that it is. Uh, and uh, wrote a book by that title, but she also wrote many other books as well and had really been doing uh, the work and created the field of conscious evolution dating all the way back to um, the Eisenhower era. Uh, and she had the opportunity to meet with President Eisenhower and, and, and asked him in the wake of uh, the, the atomic bomb dropping on Japan, I was like, what is the meaning of our power that's good? And actually, uh, the, the amazing thing is that President Eisenhower said, I don't know. And that's what started Barbara on her quest uh, to, to create the field and answer the, the question, to create the field of conscious evolution and then answer that question, what is the meaning of our, our technological power, which is so immense? What is the meaning of it that's good? So we continue the discussion and uh, Social Chrysalis is a platform that uh, is providing the means for uh, conscious evolutionaries to create programs uh, to, to put the principles of conscious evolution in action. So that's what we're all about. And uh, the platform is absolutely inspired by Barbara Marks Hubbard and, and her work. So the, I'm going to start, I'll do a quick screen share here because there's a definition of conscious evolution as written by Barbara. And this is um, in many of her books, she has got a glossary in the back. Uh, and this is from a, a book called 52 Codes. And that the, the definition of conscious evolution, I'll just read this to you. The, it's the evolution of evolution from unconscious to conscious choice. The opportunity for humans to participate consciously in the process of creation. 
arising now as humans gain capacities to destroy or create with the power we used to attribute to gods. Learning-wise, ethical conscious evolution, self and social is the key requirement for the survival and fulfillment of our potential as a species. Our crisis lead to transformation or to devolution and self-destruction. Universal humans are learning to be evolution, to be causal as well, to be caused. And then with that, let me move to another uh, image. And this is uh, the wheel of co-creation. Um, this, this gives you a visual of, of conscious evolution as Barbara Marks Hubbard taught it. And the universe, of course, in the lower left of this image starts with the Big Bang. And then there are turns on the spiral. So you see the impulse of evolution is sort of this beam that just goes from the lower left to the upper right. And then there's a spiral and each turn of the spiral is uh, the impulse of evolution, the beats of, of evolution going through time. So from the big bang, we have uh, uh, the creation of the universe happening. And then eventually there's the creation of earth, earth, and then uh, the creation of life on earth, uh, which is like single celled life. Um, and then the creation of multi-celled life through animals, and then the, the creation of human life. And then the, the wheel you see is the turn, the, the, the turn on the spiral where we're at right now, which is um, this evolution of uh, the human from being uh, self-aware and being aware of our individual um, egoic selves to it's turning around this spiral and, and, and you see all of these 12 different sectors of society that we, we have created. And we are, we bring all these things together in ultimately in harmony. As we do that, you'll see the next turn on the spiral uh, is to universal humanity. So we're, we're moving from an egoic self-centered self to a universal self. So as we, is we evolve each of these 12 sectors of society. And these are just very, like you might say, meta sectors. Uh, of course, there's a lot of subsectors that can be um, extrapolated from these. But as these things come into harmony and we truly uh, release the, the individual egoic, like tribal self, and we move to a universal self, um, then we become a universal humanity. And, and the way Barbara would put this is we become the, the, the new human, or we move from being homo sapiens, sapiens to uh, homo universalis. Uh, and, and again, this is a very, this is a very, very, very brief primer on conscious evolution, but it gives you some context uh, uh, for our discussion tonight because we, uh, it's, it, we're in a very interesting time. Uh, Barbara often talked about our crisis is a birth. It was really a mantra of hers. And, and, and it, we obviously are in a, a very major crisis uh, in the form of the, the coronavirus right now. And uh, there is rightfully so a lot of concern and there's fear around it and there's also opportunity. And we can look at it from different perspectives and, and to be fully attuned to what's happening and how people are not only um, responding to it and 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 working through it, but then what does it call us to do? If we, if we consider ourselves to be conscious evolutionaries, what is, what is the meaning of what's happening now? And if our crisis is a birth, how do we take this crisis, which is absolutely global, no doubt about it, and how does it become a birth of something new and, and emergent? So, um, so those of us who are faculty on social chrysalis have uh, different focus areas. Uh, in, in our work and in the programs that we've developed. So um, what I'd like to do is just start the panel discussion. And again, if you've got a question, please put that in the Q&A and let me know if you, you'd like me to promote you and you'd like to come on screen and I'm happy to ask it. But let me, just to kick things off, I want to start with uh, Rebecca Becker, who, um, uh, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about the educational sector. So in those 12 sectors of the wheel, one of them is education. And Rebecca, what do you see as being 
the, the crisis in education and what is the opportunity uh, uh, that we are presented with uh, in, in not only the context of what's happening, but what's been evolving through the years because the education sector has been really prepared, uh, has, has been focused on preparing young people to really just work in the world such as, as it has been, and now the world is changing. So that's the question I would pose to you to start kick us off. Um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say I'm not an educator, I've not been in the system, and I'm not an expert in that regard. So I wanted to let you know my, my um, interest is that the education system didn't work for my children. And so when you're deep in the woods and you're like, what is going on here? You have some initiative to try to figure out and work it, you know, work out something for your own family. So what I, I really resonated with the, the movie, The Race to Nowhere, and you guys might remember it, but it, the basic tenets of that were um, parents today are expected to raise high achieving children who are good at everything, academics, sports, the arts, community service. They're an, achieve, an achievement obsessed culture, overburdened schedules, their student, student suicide, academic cheating, and people have just checked out. It just seems like that we just were so go, 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 and then it got to be this competitive mix. So if, if you didn't have your kid in everything, and if they weren't in all the APs, you were missing out. So it just fed on itself, and it just didn't work. It just wasn't natural to how we were made that you know it's very unnatural for kids in elementary school just to have to sit still to not be outside to be just taking in information and not exploring with their own creativity um, memory driven one size fits all so it was kind of like pushing you through this homogeneous tunnel that really wasn't working for very many kids because many kids aren't renaissance kids and what i found out through my personal experiences i had kind of niche kids like they were really good at certain things but the current educational system really didn't fit for them so what's happening here with that i'm seeing with the virus so we have schools shutting down and parents are now kind of taking up the responsibility of making sure their kids are getting online they're realizing how hard it is that they, they're not equipped and um, and I think they probably have more, uh, you know, um, appreciation for teachers at this point. We're seeing that kids can't be in the same room doing it and they're, they're having to do it online. And then the whole financial piece when it comes to higher education with so many, with the economy crashing, is the college, you know, college for everyone at a really high price. It keeps escalating and escalating. Is that really a model of where we're going? And I think it really calls to attention some of the things that were actually broken in the system before. So I've got three things, Stephen, if you want me to briefly talk about that I think are working, um, that are kind of coming out that I would like to see move forward, if, if that works for you. Sure, please go ahead. So and these are just examples. I'm going to do an example from a preschool to middle, to, um, middle education and high school, as well as um, college. So what I found that was working is uh, in preschool, there's a program called Reggio Emilia. And uh, it believes that kids came in here born with what they called a, a hundred languages. They believe that children are considered to be knowledge bearers. So they are encouraged to share their thoughts and ideas about everything that they could meet or do during the day. They're influenced by this belief. The child is be held as a beautiful, powerful, competent creature with curious and full of potential and ambitious desires. Now that's very different than just pushing the ABC model on, on these kids. So my, my, both of my children were lucky to go through a program at St. Anne's uh, Day School here in Atlanta that really caused them to just dive deep into whatever they were doing. And that's so affirming for these kids who really come in with a gift and a higher purpose. Um, another program that I've just come across is called the Seven Mindsets, and it it's going it's in hundreds of schools right now. But it was based on research the uh, five you know they did multi year research on the five hundred like most successful people in the world and the happiest and and just people who were thriving and they came up 
with um, certain mindsets that need to be taught so they can really be successful and thriving. One is everything is possible. Path first. We are connected. 100% personal accountability. An attitude of gratitude. Live to give. And the time is now which all really resonate with me being on the spiritual path to know that we are really the author, authors of our own life, but we do need support from others and we need to be grateful every day. We need to know that action is now and to really encourage us to dream big. And that's what I think has been missing in some of the education programs, kind of forced to like, how can I make the most money? And it's, it really needs to be turned on its head of what gifts can I share with the world and not be stifled. The last thing, and I'm happy, I see David Mercier is on the call here, and he can maybe talk about it a little bit further. But I was really impressed with the program he's doing at John Hopkins. Uh, and it's really just a, a two-week program. And it's about, it's called the art and science of happiness. And he really uh, puts forth Ken Wilber's theory um, on happiness is related to our developmental state. It's an outlook that takes shape, positively developing social, mental, and physical health. And many of us confuse happiness with impermanent joys and pleasures. Uh, the most difficult struggles occur when people are chasing that state of happiness to the detriment of their own development. So he's got a program that teaches um, college kids. Um, they go into, they really practice journaling, mindfulness, meditation, principles of positive psychology, such as flow and learned optimism. And they pair that with the impact of nutrition on the brain, uh, concepts and practical skills in emotional and social intelligence and transforming negative thoughts and patterns. And I'd love to see this go into every college. And it's just right now just in its infancy and it's getting a little bit more traction. But these are the types of programs that we really need to be looking at happiness and social well-being because the suicides on campus are just skyrocketing and how we can we get really back to the basics of just keeping our kids happy enough so they can learn. So that's just a f three things that I think are out there and that would have a lot of momentum if they were expanded more fully and globally. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, and I appreciate it. And this is, this is one of the, the things that Barbara, as is, is those of you who know who followed her taught, was, um, you know, it's important for us to, 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 to find and focus on in what's working in the world, right? So, um, because we do hear so much, uh, um, I mean, the media is focused on kind of what, what bleeds leads is the attitude so and, and and not that we shouldn't be informed about those things but th there also needs to be a balance and a focus on uh what's working so rebecca really appreciate you um putting those things out there uh and then as well uh, just a really quick reflection you know in in this time now so many students all of a sudden are you know just instantly having to to go online to finish their their classes out and uh, I mean, I know from my own, um, hearing from my brother, he's got two teenagers, the, the system is woefully unprepared to address that. Um, and, and basically, at least in my brother's uh, his, the school system for his kids, they basically say, well, whatever grade you have is what you've got. And, and all of the online learning is just extra credit right now. So, so if, if, if somebody was coming through with straight A's, this is really the end of their school year because there's no incentive to, to further participate. And I was talking to my own mom the other day about this. And I said, you know, what I think is to me, if I had children and I don't, um, but what seems to be missing is an opportunity for uh, students to uh, just connect through the online channel and talk about like, what's the meaning of, of where we are at in the world and how as young people we're gonna show up to, uh, to make it a better world and um and it seems like there's a great opportunity for young people to actually problem solve in and among themselves and i'm not sure that's happening anywhere and if any of you know of something like that it, it, i'd be curious to hear about it um so thank you rebecca and, and then um i guess the next question i like to just bring sharon in because uh sharon's program is um, activate your female power. And I should also say Rebecca's program is find your purpose on social chrysalis. 
Um, but uh, Sharon, um, her program is Activate Your Female Power, and it's, it's so much about balancing the feminine uh, aspect with uh, um, the, the masculine and not re not re replacing it, but uh, feminine masculine balance. And it's also very much about like how we treat the feminine in the context of how we treat the earth. So, mm -hmm. and Sharon, you know, the thing before the, the coronavirus, the big issue that was getting a lot of press and rightfully so is climate change. And now, you know, kind of coronavirus is getting all the headlines, yet climate's still a very real and very present issue. So could you talk a little bit about how you see what's happening right now, kind of uh, dovetailing with the climate discussion and with your work um, to advocate for feminine masculine balance in the world? Mm. Thank you, Stephen. So... My work, my evolutionary impulse, which I came to see as an evolutionary impulse through working with Barbara Marks Hubbard, is to restore the sacredness of the female body to the planet. And for me, the female body is the microcosm of the earth body, the greater earth body. And that understanding came to me through my own personal experience of my female body processes and then being drawn um, irresistibly to, to go into great detail and depth in looking into the anatomy and physiology of the female body and how it worked. And the deeper I went, the more I could see the resonance with the earth body. And then uh, during my studies and research, so I did a PhD on the topic of the female body and female body processes as spiritual phenomena. What I discovered was that in ancient pre-patriarchal times, the female body was honoured and revered because there was a female deity and it was understood that that female deity's body was present in the earth body. So all of those things become interconnected, the earth body, the female deity, the female body. And there were many thousands of years, the archaeological findings show that for some 30,000 years, the female deity was worshipped, the earth body was regarded as sacred, people lived in, in a harmony and respectful relationship with nature, and then with the instigation of patriarchy in about 4300 BCE, that whole thing shifted. And uh, when, you know, we know the results of that because we're now living in a, a, a male dominant world where masculine energies have dominated for many thousands of years to the detriment of the feminine energies and the female body and the earth body. And what I saw and what I also learned in my studies was that a faithful remnant of that knowledge and that connection with the earth body and the balance of masculine and feminine was brought forward in indig many indigenous cultures. They preserved that wisdom and knowledge and they brought it through into present time. And so I've been drawing in, since this whole coronavirus thing started, I've looked to those indigenous elders to find their wisdom because I know they're the keepers of an ancient understanding about how to live in harmony and balance with the earth. And for example, here in Australia, the Aboriginal elders have been custodians of this land for like 60 odd thousand years, maybe even longer, and have lived in harmony with it and have known how to live with fire and the different elements in a, a way that is sustainable for everybody. And so I've been listening to those elders and looking for their wisdom about it. And when I hear them saying is that the consciousness of the earth is in her body and Things have reached a tipping point now. I know uh, Greta Thunberg talked about needing to pull the emergency brake, and that really resonated with me because of the escalation in, in carbon in the atmosphere just being completely unsustainable, and we've only got a certain amount left in the tank to be able to continue. To me, this is like the emergency brake's been pulled, and yes, everything's ground to the halt. So it's 
what I'm hearing the Indigenous elders, so for example, Auntie Malara is an Australian Indigenous elder. What she said is that change needs to happen. And in Australia here, her understanding is that on the 20th of March, the old song line finished. So the, in the Aboriginal dreaming, there's a song line that traverses the land and consciousness. And on March the 20th, the old song line's finished and a new song line opened on March the 21st that requires greater awareness of our interconnectedness with the earth and with one another. And if nothing else, that's exactly what COVID-19 is confronting us with, our interconnectedness with one another and with nature and the natural world around us. So I guess for me, it's my focus before this happened was the sacredness of the female body. And now it's become even more imperative because this is the local accessible place where I get to connect with nature right under my own nose here and now and where I can connect through my body to the earth body, to the consciousness that's present in the earth body, to attend to what she needs from me, from us, in order to find our way forward. And you alluded to the, to the fact, Stephen, earlier about how Barbara Marx Hubbard described our crisis as a birth. There has to be a breakdown before there can be a breakthrough. And we're right in the birth canal at the moment with this extraordinary event that's happening around the world. And so how do we midwife what wants to come through? I have a deep faith that what is happening is for us, not to us. And so how do we hold that wisdom and connect into what is yet unknown but is imminent and desiring to be communicated. So one of the practical ways in which I do that personally is regularly throughout the day, I go and put my body on the ground. I have a blanket, I go and throw the blanket down, I put my body on the ground, I put my head down and I pour out whatever it is that's on my heart and then I listen. And I always come away from those moments with renewed hope and sometimes very clear guidance about what's mine to do, what's my individual piece to do. And I feel like that's what this moment is asking for us, a greater consciousness, a greater receptivity. There's no experts here. We're all, we're all figuring it out as we go. And that makes it an incredible opportunity to be able to access something new and make it the birth of something better. And um, a number of the Indigenous elders, as well as contemporary thinkers, have described the epidemic as an epidemic of fear and separation. And I think there's a deep truth in that. And so how do we want to transmute that and transform it into an epidemic of interconnection and an epidemic of love? So for me, it's because I'm female and I live in this female body and um, guiding, teaching, sounding that message is what I'm here on the planet to do. That's what we can do as women. And the other piece, the final piece that I'll say about that is that, you know, you look at the mammal world, mother mammals are so fiercely protective. You try and take a cub off a, a mother bear, she'll rip your throat out. We have this deep instinctual biological leadership inside us that we can access and when it's activated it's very clear we know what to do we know what's ours to do to protect life so um yeah i think we just need to to really attune deeply to what the earth needs us to do and to be her willing ambassadors to do those those simple things to come back to who we are as human beings connected with ourselves with each other and with her so thank you, Sharon. And so to that, your point about that instinct, um, I want to bring Marty Spiegelman in because I just feel like there's a dovetailing to what Marty's work is and just like feeling into uh, what the earth is calling us to do and drawing our attention to. So Marty, I just, in a way of a response or some, maybe some uh, added color to what Sharon said, I'd just be curious what you're sensing and feeling through this. 
Um, well, I, I love Sharon's comments, and I'm so glad that you brought in indigenous elders. Um, I think um, from what I've been taught in South America, what I see in the COVID crisis is actually a, a rebalancing. I, I don't think it's a crisis of fear so much um, as the universe and the mother planet rebalancing two incredible forces that always have to be in conversation. And one of those forces is the wild or the unformed, and the other force is the force that domesticates or forms things. And we have, in a way, um, individually and on a community-wide basis, on a society-wide basis, we've kind of over-domesticated things. We have a way of life in the world these days where everything has to be controlled and um, just so, and uh, we look at the world as right or wrong. Are we following the rules? Are we not following the rules? And um, we've gotten to a place where in our consciousness, we feel that as humans, we're the ones to set things in order. And we've forgotten there's a whole big universe <laughs> that's full of incredibly enormous powers, the Earth being one of them. And those powers really have the first say. So uh, I think we really need to listen to the elders that yes, there is a, a new song line that has just begun. And this is, it's resonant with work that some of the elders I know in South America have done. We've just completed a a, a 30 day um, prayer session and are beginning the second one on exactly the same days. Um, and so I think we're looking at the universe reminding humans how things work and what our place is. And to remember our place, we need to be collective. One of the things I love about the slowdown because of the virus, it, it has its um, very difficult repercussions. But as we slow down and have to stay six feet apart, I find that people are paying more attention to one another. That this movement of larger forces is bringing us back into our hearts, into our connectivity, and into a creative stage where we're thinking about new ways to come back together. And I think this is the, the really big power of what's going on in the world now. Yeah, thank you, Marty. Um, you know, the thing that really struck me was when you said, like, we're, we're as humans, wanting to control. And mm -hmm. uh, I just, the little bit that I do go out when I go shopping and so forth, um, you guys, like, I sense a tension. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's less traffic than ever, and people seem to be driving even all the more crazy sometimes. And, and I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Um, um, but I, I suspect there's maybe something about like feeling a response to not feeling in control. I, I don't know. And I'm just curious if anybody has thoughts on, on, um, cause if sort like I come from the a business background as well. And, you know, and, and, um, uh, you know, we, we look at the business community as or the business realm as, as having some things under control. And that doesn't always, that certainly doesn't seem appear evident, at least at the moment. So I would throw this out to anybody on the panel is like, what's, what's your sense of um, what we are having to, how we're having to roll with these, the chaos and, and your sense of like, what's, what are we in control of? What are we not? And are we supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if I could, and yeah, a few please. more comments yes. to what I said. Um, one of the things about consciousness is, is that it's an open-ended state. And we humans, uh, especially in business, I think, well, in education, probably any field we could find, we've developed this tendency to head toward a goal and pin it down. You know, I have a goal, I have to reach that thing, then I'm done, I've got that pin on, I've got it controlled, now I'm gonna do another one, and I wanna stay on my path. We've just developed this way of believing that we are in control, and we simply don't know how to work with the larger forces that create us anyway. So I think this is, um, it's a kind of diminishment of our conscious capacity that we need to open up again, and uh, I think we need to consider living in open-ended ways, which are actually much more fulfilling. Mm. And perhaps more on, on, like on, scary. After that one, can I jump in after? Yeah, that one? yeah, please. Yeah. 
Yeah. Stephen, yeah. I'm just thinking about using this metaphor of a birth again. There's a certain intrinsic unpredictability about birthing because it's something greater than self that's coming through. And so it's analogous to this moment. There's something greater than we can control happening and we're doing what we can to control the spread of the virus and so on. But the, the birth of this new, whatever it is that desires to come through, it's the same in a, an actual physical birth. You do the preparation, you know how to do your, your resourcing with your breath and your body knowledge and movement and your mindset and so on. But then there comes a time when you just have to surrender to something that's bigger than you and allow it to come through. You're very present, you're very conscious, you're very yeah. at, like the, at the helm of the yacht rather than driving something. And so you're working with the elements, with your intelligence, with your willingness, with your receptivity, but you, you in a way have to surrender to the greater. And I hear that's what you're saying, Marty, as well, that there's this whole yeah. greater that, and this is what the Indigenous elders are saying too, that we can trust this greater. It is trustworthy, yeah. just like birth is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 well said. Yeah, Barbara, please. Well, you ask um, about our experience of things that are in the chaos and the changing and all the challenges and the realm that Walter and I, um, in the blue shirt over here, uh, oh, Robert, you have, Walter, raise your hand. <laughs> Walter, <laughs> um, we work in the realm of spiritual spirituality. And we teach, write, and speak about transformational spiritual practices that assist us in um, leading lives of consciousness, creativity, and deep purpose. And so we do, you know, talks and retreats and workshops. And, and we're right now in the middle of teaching an eight-week course, which is curious, this synchronicity of um, this course, the last course of classes tomorrow, that we've gone through this. Um, and what I wanted to share is everything that we've learned about spirituality and experience ourselves is that that is the unchanging realm. Our true divine essence, who we are, which is an aspect of spirit in form unique to each one of us, is that part of us that does not change. Um, there's a T.S. Eliot poem that I've always loved, and it says, at the still point of the turning world, and if you think of the Wheel of Fortune in Tarot or something, at the still point of the turning world, there the dance is. So where the true dance is for us is, in, is inside of us. It's when we connect with our source. It's when we, like one of our, our foundational spiritual practices is meditation. So we would encourage everyone, you know, to, to hype up your spiritual practices during this time of um, sequestration because that's the very thing. That's where we go inside and we quiet. We actually let the thoughts do their thing and the emotions do their thing, but we keep returning to center and we listen for the still small voice. And one of my goals is to have it be a, a loud, strong voice one day that is so clear that it just guides everything I do and I'm working toward that. But that's where we, we come to a point we see in meditation that we can, the world, our mind goes crazy, our emotions do their things, we have sensations, we're twitchy, but we can sit there, we can observe. And it's the place where we can examine our lives. We can, in our course, we take people through 12 different spiritual practices. And it's very deep work, but it's the place, this, this is the perfect time. I feel like it's almost like a gift of this virus. It sounds terrible. And I don't mean to um, diminish all the, all the very awful, challenging things that are happening in the world and, and people dying and all that. But at the same time, we have this opportunity to go inside ourselves and look at our lives and look at our patterns and attitudes, beliefs and old stories and say, is this who I really am? Where did I pick these up? Do I really believe this? And when this whole thing is over, do I want, well, who do I want to go back out into the world as? Do I want to just jump back into my crazy, stressful, turning wheel life? Or do I want to bring something new? Do I want to make a different kind of contribution? 
But to make that different kind of contribution, I have to shift something in myself. I have to be willing to let go of what doesn't serve me anymore and to embrace what is calling me. Um, you were talking about it, Sharon. I think, you know, the evolutionary impulse is calling us to be our highest human potential, not our smallest, not our tiniest, not our most suppressed. And that it's really important. And when Barbara Mark Hubbard talks about we're at the tipping point, it's either we could go, we could go back to devolution, which sometimes it really feels like that's the course that we're on, especially in the United States um, right now. But it sounds like it's, it's on a larger scale as well. Or if each one of us makes that choice to choose the highest evolutionary impulse that we are, the goodness, the truth, the oneness, the wisdom, um, the, the sense that we're, we're an interconnected universe. Everything and everyone matters. And we can't keep destroying it. So here's our place now in this chrysalis. This, this whole platform is called social chrysalis. And it's a place where we, where we transform. Um, in our course, we chose the, the uh, symbol of the butterfly, the blue morpho butterfly is kind of a symbol of transformation that we, we want to take people through. And in that, we studied a little bit about um, the, the process that a butterfly goes through. And um, we're kind of looking at this time, both in the little cauldron of our course, but also in this time with COVID-19, to um, the, the first stage of a butterfly is um, it, an egg is born, it is hatched on a leaf, and it's a, a special kind of leaf that when it hatches and the caterpillar comes out, that the caterpillar then eats the leaf, so it needs that for nourishment, so it's a very particular process. And then the caterpillar starts forming its, its chrysalis around itself. And it goes inside that. And um, that's the place where this caterpillar, which is short and no wings and kind of stubby, goes inside and its body totally disintegrates. And for me, a parallel for us is, you know, our beliefs, our attitudes, our stories, everything that isn't us, because who we really are is spirit and form. And that is the biggest, most magnificent thing we can possibly be. So why would we hold on to all these little things? So in this process of the chrysalis, all of that dissolves. And we do that through, you know, through forgiveness, through self-compassion, through what's calling us, through releasing things that don't serve us. And then, what starts to form inside the chrysalis and what we're doing as the social chrysalis platform here, this is what we're trying to do is like, what wants to emerge? And so that's when the butterfly pieces start to form in there. And then uh, it comes the time when it's time for the birth. And the birth, the first thing, it, it, the butterfly comes out and its wings are wet. And, and so often, because um, they've been inside the chrysalis there, and we need that time to um, let our wings dry and get clear on our purpose. And then we, we transform and we fly out into the world with our purpose and um, being in service to transform this planet. So that's why I see, Stephen, when you ask about what, where we can do the inner work in the face of whatever is going on out there, you know, the deaths, the spread of everything, the, it, you know, if one, if one puts only one's attention out there, it would be the most depressing time in the history of the planet, probably. Um, but that's not, we, we are a cause here. We, we can do something different and we can emerge and bring something so transformational to the planet is what I'd like to hold for us. Great, thank you, Barbara. Uh, so um, to that point, because uh, I think it's an important one because a lot of people are feeling, I, I feel like they're feeling like that, that just that, helplessness right and um and then at the same time we're hearing stories i'm mean, because i'm gonna go back to rebecca's like what's what's going right and uh, one of the uh, i think julie had written in the chat about this too uh, a little bit uh, about how you know people really it's it's calling people to show up uh, uh people are re-establishing like real relationships with their neighbors asking how they can help um going shopping for neighbors who who might be at high risk and shouldn't be out that those sorts of things. So like, so it's almost like going back to the future and we're reconnecting with community. And um, so, so there's like, there's tension, there's this tension. I feel like there's this, uh, 
the 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 the, the unknown. Like we, we don't know how long people are going to be uh, under these stay at home orders and so forth. And there's the fear about like what can I touch and like be careful about touching my face and all of this stuff. And then uh, and that can be very paralyzing. And it, it is for a lot of people, of course. And then there's the the what's going right is how people are showing up for one another. Um, so, and I'm curious, like, how are you all observing that in the different sectors of society, whether it's, you know, education, spirituality, the arts, um, health, uh, of course, healthcare. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of the cracks in the system are very evident in the healthcare system, especially here in the U S because of what's been happening. So, um, and at the same time, people are, have been showing up to do positive things in response to the cracks in the veneer and, and doing their best to patch those up. So I just throw that out as a general, you know, just a general question. What are your observations about like what's going right? What's being, what's being caused to go right in response to perhaps what's felt hopeless or what is feeling hopeless? Well, Stephen, you know, one of the, um, you know, if we look at, you know, consciousness, right? Without the divine feminine or feminine, which is wisdom, you know, in our consciousness and being born in that, you know, we're, we're lost. We're in the intellectual power, you know, aspect of, you know, really, you know, something else. So the feminine balanced in all of us, with, and then also the masculine is so important in everything. And, you know, what we're seeing here in this world right now is people coming together in so many ways. Um, and at the same time, great polarization. Also, like, how can we, you know, who, who's here to, you know, grab the, you know, take the power, right, as well. So in this aspect of our, our chrysalis and how we're changing, I mean, to me, is this really, you know, Corona means crown. Is this really about a Corona virus, a virus, or is this about crown of illumination, right? Mm -hmm. A full, you know, stepping into a fuller capacity of who we are. I mean, activating not, you know, you know, more of our strands of DNA, right? I mean, we have, it's science proven, we have 12, right? And, and you know, just not two. But of course, our all educated materials are saying we have two, right? Well, and it's not junk DNA, it's dormant DNA. And how did it get to be dormant, right? So at this point in time, when, you know, defined feminine, fine masculines, you know, balancing within us and in the consciousness of the world, you know, we're going to have to see things breaking down in order to really accept that in this you know, chrysalis right? To really allow ourselves to be born uh, and start that full capacity of our whole activation of who we more are. We're not, we don't live, well, let's put it that we live in a linear, linear time, you know, construct because we're enforced there. But it's really a multidimensional universe and we won't know that fully capacity until we really, allow, you know, we are allowed to build on this whole aspect of our full DNA that's offered to us right now. And so with me and the chrysalis, I mean, I'm surrendered. I got, you know, my eyes closed, but I open up every so often to make sure what the heck other people are doing that may stop us from reaching that, okay, that want the power, haven't weaved in the wisdom that needs to be weaved in for what's going on right now. So in this aspect of ourselves, we have to step up in that light and that essence of who we are, know who we are. And at times we have to say, no, I'm a sacred sovereign being, and this is the way it's going to be. This is where we're going. No, right? We have to be strong enough to say that too. And that's not a masculine thing. That's a strong feminine thing too. And when that's balanced, you're strong. And we can say, no, this is the right path, right? We're not going back to this other aspect. We are here living in the light and love and consciousness of who we are. And we want our sacred beingness and our full capacity as a human species that it can be. This is what's upon us right now. This whole aspect of golden age is not what has been or any of power grab. 
right? So we have to really pay attention to what's going out there and who's creating the polarizations because that's not it. Us people, we, we get it, right? So we now have to look at who our leaders are, you know, and definitely in the globalist, you know, aspect of things because as far as I'm concerned, there's a darker agenda um, that we have to be aware of. And can we show up in this aspect of what we know is, is here? Sure, we start with ourselves and we allow it to happen and be that inspiration and say, no, we're sacred sovereign beings. This is the way we're going, right? So from that capacity, I mean, let's balance ourselves. Let's, you know, resolve these wounds. Let's show up in the spirit of love that we know we are in the full capacity of, you know, feminine and masculine and, uh, and take our sovereign rights again. And, and this is what's upon us. That crown of illumination, crown of our heart, crown of so much more. And, and I'm excited at this time. And I know at this time we have to show up from that place. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Robert. The rest you know, of my I'm, I, I'm reminded uh, Barbara had, uh, this was, this was in a, a, a small, smaller session I was in with her at one point. And, um, you know, she said, you know, we all, we, we all don't look so powerful. <laughs> um, yet we're the ones being called to show up because the, the, the divine or God or whatever you want to call it um, doesn't hold the same image of, of, of what has held um, by force, you know, has, has decided like the direction that humanity is going in. And, and, and Barbara had said that, you know, the people who don't appear to have the power are actually the ones who will be the most powerful. Um, so just a reflection on what you said. Uh, there's a, a, a question from one of the attendees who, who asks, how are the arts like music, poetry, dance contributing to creating oneness in the areas you focus on? So does anybody have a reflection on that question? How are the arts like music, poetry, and dance contributing to creating oneness in the areas you focus on? <laughs> Well, I could speak a little bit to that. Um, uh, some of my, oh, do you want to go ahead? Well, Mar my, Marty, go ahead, Ben Sharon, yeah. Okay, all right, all right, we'll do it. Great minds speak at the same. Um, well, I'm teaching some of my students who are artists right now, and one of the things about music and art and dance is it takes our, one of the key components of consciousness is awareness. And it takes our awareness off the self, off the ego level self, and out into the world, not just to notice, but to engage. And that simple act of engaging the world through the senses is actually what shifts human consciousness. And that it's as simple as that. The ripple effect of one person shifting their consciousness by using their awareness differently is phenomenal. I see it all the time with my students. And I really think that this engagement with art is an engagement with the sacred. It's an engagement with sacred capacities that a human has. I mean, we have these amazing fingers. We have a, a very specially shaped throat and sinuses so we can sing. We have some kind of crazy brain that works in terms of metaphors and we can write poetry. There's some way the universe moves through us to put us into these artistic engagements. And I think it's one of the things that we can do in education and community building and family in personal development. It's, it's really, it was a, a great thing to ask about. Mm. Yeah. What I want to add to that is that if you think about the process of creation, it starts in the imaginal realm. Something has to be mm -hmm. imagined before it can be brought into the third dimensional reality. And how that's uh, inspired is often through looking at beautiful art or listening to beautiful music or um, entertaining that creative side of ourselves. You know, like I think of the, um, the music that I'm listening to at the moment, it's so heart opening and so inspires me to step into that space of just receptivity and asking you know what's mine to do and being reassured by the music or i think something like um alex gray's art where he's depicting visual 
form, energy is the primary reality. So our artists yeah. are the people who somehow are able to capture that, uh, that beauty that we haven't yet been able to grasp and put it before us in ways that really speak to our soul, not just our mind, but our soul. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, a friend read me this quote a couple of days ago by Glennon Doyle from her book Untamed, which asks the question, what is the truest, most beautiful story I want for, and it could be my family, the earth, our species after this. So what is the truest, most beautiful story I can imagine for humanity on the other side of this birthing? That's the domain of art to feed that in us, that question, so that we can be inspired and stay in that space of imagination because that's how it's going to come through. Every great invention has started in some imagination as an inspiration is so important yeah, Rebecca. One of, um, yeah one other comment about i am an artist and i kind of i, I kind of have uh was a here so what i realized it really helps balance the right and the left brain and it's the divine masculine and the feminine so with the art, we've been in such a patriarchal society about analyzing and doing and going and achieving. The art brings in the, the divine feminine and it, it just helps you relax and, and look at something on a whole other level than kind of the 3D. So I, I just love the balance of art and, and the right brain side to the, the world we're living in right now. Walter. It also brings in a little levity. I, I had an opportunity to go out today and I was in a uh, live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is known as an art center. And uh, there's a horse sculpture in someone's front yard. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And I've seen it many times. And today there was a four foot tall teddy bear riding on the horse, <laughs> dressed in a white gown with a mask on, and I just absolutely cracked up. I mean, it just, I, the power of art to provide a little humor and a little, a little relief. Uh, and I went to my destination, I came back, I saw it again, and then I went down a hill, and there was this tree that had no blossoms on it or anything. Uh, some of them are slow to, to come out, and there was a sign hanging there with handwritten on it, Tree of Hope. And then I looked again and there were glass ornaments, not Christmas ornaments, but just clear glass ornaments, maybe two dozen of them hanging in the tree. And I thought, what a creative thing to do. Um, so there's that possibility of uh, allowing us to have a good laugh. I mean, it, it, we we really do get serious about this whole thing, uh, and it, it's just a reminder that maybe we don't have to be quite so serious. Yeah, thank you, Walter. Um, Sierra has a question that she brought in, and Sierra, let me know if you want me to bring you into the to the room. Happy to do it. Um, she says, as an artist, I struggle with the polarity of wanting to just purely and freely create uh, with also needing to make living somehow. How can I bring these things into harmony? So any, any um, reflection, reflections on that? I'm going to bring Yeah, it I, I can speak again from one of my own students' experiences. Um, there's a... A concept in a lot of indigenous cultures, they, if you look at the original human languages in many, many cultures, there is no word for art. And, and art as, you know, we, we do art for art's sake, that's a, an expression in English, but in early human cultures, art was understood to be the speech of whatever forces you call the creator. And if you think, I always think of this with a capital C, and that, that big force is on the move. It will move through anything or anyone open enough for it to do that. And when it moves through, it's going to create stuff that is great for life, period. That's how it works, right? <laughs> Unless a human being gets in the way and starts to try to crimp it down. But if you're an artist, if you can 
understand yourself as a conduit for that big speech that is always on the move, looking to encode wisdom and beauty, looking to create something that's in support of life, that's going to bring through you the art that will give you a, a really good living. So instead of in the Western mind will tend to do an either or, but full consciousness, uh, think of your old indigenous self inside you, there's a, an indigenous self that knows that it's one thing. So as my own student found, she gave up trying to distinguish between what she wanted to do and what would sell. And she just lets that force speak through her. And her art just has taken this quantum leap like I can't believe. It's stunning. She's selling things. So I vote for you letting the consciousness with a capital C just flow through. Don't hold back at all. Because I think that's how the universe works. I think that's how beauty is created. I think that's how life force is supported. Sierra, do you want to uh, respond to that? And, yeah. uh, just thank you. Yeah, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. And um, it's it's this kind of tug of war sometimes, you know, I'll feel that like just create freely and don't worry about that side of it. But then this other side creeps up sometimes and it's like, but there's a business aspect and, and I reject that so much, but I know it's part of the business. Like I, I'm an actor. So like I'm a product and, um, but I also, create all sorts of other things. I write poetry. I am a floral designer. So like, and I, and I see the, um, I see how they all interweave and um, go together. Like I'm also a figure skater. And so, but I, I see the similarities between all these things, but sometimes it's hard to, um brand myself as an actor because i feel like i have all these other aspects of who i am and um and so i get caught in the trap of feeling like i need to view myself as a product rather no. than like <laughs> create <laughs> freely view yourself as a conduit um, really, like that, that, that would be that you should dream into that and throw away all the ordinary labels and realize who you actually are, because you could have a quote unquote business that um, has a department for each of the things that you love to do. And in dreaming into this, I think you'll find out which parts of you are going to be the most valuable in, in business terms and which parts you get to have just for yourself. You're in that kind of delicious stage. You're in the crystal and you've liquefied and you get to sort out the molecules and the little bonds and stuff. Um, but also I, I really wanna urge you to remember that a, a really good business is a con organism. A really good business does not drive you into either or. It creates value. Value thing that whoever buys your stuff is gonna, it's gonna be really good for them and it's good for you. So that, that love and that passion that you are, I would, I would just have you keep visioning into that until you realize a way to say that core alignment, that core passion that you have. And then that one core passion, one day it might be a figure skating show and next, the next week it might be you starring in a play, the next week it might be you doing paintings, but each of those ways of expression is, uh, it's it's a sort of spin-off of that one core thing that you are that that's a really good way to settle it and and in when we're in the chrysalis that's when we sort that stuff out so that help yes so do you feel like um like if you're being called to create in a certain way at that mm -hmm. moment like follow that and and then it might move into another realm is is that also what i'm hearing um yeah, i go back to this principle and this is a principle of consciousness it's um 
it's a little visionary project for you to, to dream into a way of describing to yourself what your real passion actually is. What thing inside you is really you? And that thing, you, you need a core alignment before these um, separate activities can feel like they're woven in you. There's something that you express. There's one thing that you really know in life, and that's why you do these things. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I love your hair. <laughs> Another piece of you. <laughs> yeah, that's I just great. want to add one more thing. When I'm listening to you speak about yeah. all the different things you do, what I hear you doing is being a conduit for the divine feminine. Yeah. The embodiment of all those different things. Mm -hmm. There's so much and beauty yeah. and creativity and birthing in all of those different domains. I'm hearing you describe your expression of the divine feminine. And I just want to say thank you for what you're bringing. Thank you. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> um, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I, um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I had a role la uh, in a film last year, and it was this really powerful woman. And um, in in um, unearthing what my uh, what was really important to me, I discovered um, pretty much everything that you said at the beginning of this meeting, and I came to realize that all of the violence and destruction on our planet is a, um, a, a direct result of the suppression of the divine feminine. Right. And um, so that like, that really fueled me and opened me up to, um, to my own power as a woman. Absolutely. And I just want to really encourage you to, to, keep bringing that through there's I can so relate to your tears and the tenderness in your heart and I think there's an ocean of grief in us as women for what's been suppressed and now is the time that that gets to come and make its contribution now is the time for us to be at the table with all these things and consciously intentionally showing up with that beauty our world needs that beauty more than ever in Sierra um you you already have it you know, there's no question that resistance that you're feeling is definitely some unresolved things related to acknowledgement and approval mm -hmm. and that goes deep mm -hmm. in the aspect of the feminine capacity mm -hmm. so i would just sit with that too so then you're not doing it for that reason you know that's necessary but you're just doing it you don't have those things anymore so that will work out with from you a little bit more since we've touched it, but um, that's was your your resistance. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sierra. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too, Stephen. Thank you, and hi, Rebecca. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, so I mean, a good point there because um, you know we've got we all have this opportunity to turn within. Right, so, so we're all necessarily in the chrysalis in some way um, because we're, we're having to spend uh, at, at the very least, you know, just time with our, with our closest loved ones under one roof and or just with ourselves. And, and we're really facing, and the way that I've been framing this um, when I talk to people about it is like, oh, it's time to get comfortable with myself because <laughs> we're really good at putting that stuff off. Um, so in, so as we evolve, you know, uh, individually and collectively, uh, how is that for all of you? I mean, how, how is, how is that like, we're here, we're having to get comfortable with ourselves and how, how does that, how does that work out for all of us? And, and how, um, how, is it like what what can we how do we see that being um useful to the people who are you know watching this like what what um wisdom do we have 
for, for me, uh, there have been some common words that have come up this evening from different perspectives. Oneness, visioning, uh, allowing ourselves to be in the mystery, creating balance. And what I find especially beneficial is going back and really doubling down on my spiritual practices. And all of those things, visioning and meditation, getting quiet, doing some reflective time, uh, very, very important, doing gratitude work, doing forgiveness work. Uh, and I, I liken it to a professional sports team. They, they play on a given day, but the rest of the week they spend in practice. So if we have an idea of what it is we want to become, we should be practicing that outcome in advance so that we're prepared. And for me, that I'm sort of pragmatic about it. The uh, spiritual practices ground me, uh, give me hope, and it's not a it's not a function of formal religion. It's it's um, a knowingness that I am, that I am. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Walter. Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, I've been, um, it's been an interesting time because I'm feeling like now's my time to start even doing more because I've kind of been working on my stuff for a couple of years now. And now I'm feeling, wow, I need to show up big time for people who maybe haven't explored it. So I feel like it now's the time for me to be holding space for others. And I'm really interested in the idea of the compassionate witness, which is not diving deep into the suffering and having to feel it myself, but really being there empathetically for somebody and just allowing them to speak their truth, whatever that is, and holding that compassionate witness space. And finding myself trying to be a loving awareness as well as a neutral observer to all the craziness that's that's going on right now. So it's an interesting space. I think the space I'm finding myself in is is different than a, a lot of people. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Um, as we start to approach the, the, the end of our time together, I wanted to just allow each of the panelists just to talk briefly about the, the program that you offer on Social Chrysalis, because um, we're, we're all um, you know, agents of transformation, we're all conscious evolutionaries, and uh, my vision for this platform and I, and I say this to everyone. I don't just say this to the panelists. I mean, I, I, this invitation is extended to, to anyone who's got, uh, who's doing the work of conscious evolution and is, is seeking a platform for it. Uh, because we certainly know that all of, you know, all of the, the big names that we have heard in this realm, all of the authors who sold millions of books have platforms. And, you know, Barbara Marks Hubbard, the thing I learned from her was that we all have genius, or at least the thing that was underscored for me was that, that you know, we all have genius, we all have gifts, um, we're, we're all brought to earth to express them. And um, I felt in, in the wake of working with Barbara Marks Hubbard that I was inspired to create a platform to, to um, allow and give people the the channel to express their gifts if they're especially if they have the skills and the wisdom to teach some aspect of conscious evolution and you don't have to have sold a million books to do it so um so w w with that is the is kind of the preamble i just want to go around the room and have everyone talk a little bit about the program they offer on the platform so robert why don't we start with you just briefly all right, so mine is uh, on increasing consciousness. And of course I give information, but the most important thing is I give experiential um, transformational connection practices, I call them versus meditation. Um, because I believe awareness, when you actually connect, work with things, you actually become more aware <laughs> uh, versus meditating, maybe zoning out. But um, so we go through a lot of different, you know, aspects of understanding 
uh, our energy, quantum aspects and connecting. And then one of the, the greatest things is, you know, authentic 5D Stargate uh, to where you're going to really start to be lit up and transformed, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and because this is a time to do it. So I was so uh, appreciative to be able to do the workshop uh, live with a bunch of people and offer it here on Social Chrysalis. And, um, you know, I always break it down very practical and simple things. And that's what I, you know, encourage people to do is uh, it's not a whole lot of, you know, uh, data learning that we have to go into. We learn it, then the experiential aspect of it, you really get it. So. Thank you for Stephen. Let me share that. Sure. Thank you, Robert and Rebecca. Yeah. Um, getting back to what you're saying about Barbara Marks Hubbard, she said that everyone has a genius, and she also talked about deepest heart's desire, and I believe they go hand in hand. And when I was kind of waking up spiritually, it was really important to me. I kept getting an urge to know what my purpose was, and and was introduced to some tools that were really helpful. One of them was human design. And it's kind of like we all have different energy sequence, you know, energy ways that we work in the world. Some are manifestors and they're here to initiate. Some are generators. Some are projectors to here to guide deeply. And some are just reflecting what's out there. And most people don't even know what their human design is. So that's one of the things. So I was led to look at all the different self-discovery tools. And my program is called Find Your um, Unique Gifts and Higher Purpose, because I believe we have that genius and it's just waiting to be discovered. And some of these tools, um, I'll go into them. One's identity mapping, kind of asking questions to really get to that, who you really are at your core. Um, there's uh, the Enneagram, which most people have heard of, human design, and then, um, a platform that came from human design is called the gene keys which is just a fabulous way to just by putting your birth date and your birth time and the place you're able to really pr produce a chart that shows you where what your purpose is what your gifts are what your life's work is and then what your shadows are what are the challenges that are coming up for you and it's on this piece of paper and and it's amazing how informative that can be to really like, oh, I kind of always knew that I was a leader or a guy, but now it's on, uh, it's really affirmed for me. And it really helps you just really step in fully to your purpose when you have some of these tools. So I've interviewed six people uh, and also the Akashic Record to really go into all these tools. It'll teach you how to pull off your free designs. And then they talk about each of these different um, types of being or, you know, like if you're uh, in the Enneagram point one through nine, and it'll tell you what that's about. And it's just a really great, good way to know yourself. So then you can step more fully into co-create with others through your actual genius. Mm. Thanks, Rebecca. And Lauren puts in the Q&A, yay for human design. So there you go. <laughs> um, Marty. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I'll follow in Robert's footsteps. I have two courses available on Social Chrysalis, both about consciousness. The first one is Precision Consciousness, and that's an easy course to take. It's a, it's a dialogue. I'm being interviewed by a colleague of mine about human consciousness, how it functions, and what the core principles of consciousness are. So we have some very interesting discussions covering uh, the principles of consciousness and how they help us create good community, good relationships, good business, good governance. And at the end of each segment, there are some very easy um, exercises. You go outside and do in nature, and there's good guidance so you know what to pay attention to. If you do a little nature exercise, it changes you. And so there's guidance on how to, to notice those changes. And that's a very, very easy um, way to listen and do a little bit of learning and see what it feels like to maybe shift your consciousness. And, and I agree with Robert that awareness is a big part of it. The other course that I have is called Visionary Skills, and that's a three-level course that goes into a lot more detail of what I call the technologies of consciousness. And um, that goes into much more specific training with awareness and with the structure of your energy body and then how to, once you learn to use awareness with a little skill, how to start embodying these principles 
and again, how to apply the changes that are going to occur in your own consciousness. Um, and the Visionary Skills course comes with a bonus course on archetypes. And archetypes, if you think of an archetype as a body of wisdom, it's a very important course on an aspect of human consciousness. It talks about how we carry wisdom in our lineages, uh, how we carry wisdom at a transcendent level way beyond the ego's interference. And so it's a good part of us, good level of us to get to know. So those are my two courses. Great. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Barbara and Walter, uh, you talked a little bit about your course already. Is there anything else you want to say about creative aging? Well, um, our course, I'll show you. This is our wheel of spiritual practices for creative aging. Let's see. I don't know how to best do this. But we have um, 12 different uh, spiritual practices that we go through in the course and they go from meditation and reviewing our lives, see who we really are, self-compassion, forgiveness, gratitude, releasing, and then what's calling us now? What's our, what's, uh, and some of the tools are things like visioning, what's spirit's highest vision for, for our life. And then we work with our life purpose and intentions and then, we also work with things like how do we renew ourselves? You know, this is, this is a complete human being here that we're trying to bring forth. And what is the role of inspirational classes and in reading in, in this? And the value of being in community and then service. What, what areas of service do we live in? And so it's a very, once we go through these 12 different spiritual practices, we get a pretty good, clear look at our lives. And um, we get to explore how we're doing in those. I don't know if I mentioned forgiveness and gratitude. And um, so we find that, you know, a full life, we have to evaluate who we are, what we've been up until now. Who are we really? We have spiritual practices to get us in touch with who, what is our really true divine nature? And then how does that want to be expressed in the world? And um, so it's a very hands-on class. We get to examine old beliefs and attitudes and stories that no longer serve us. And then we get to see, well, what's calling us now? Who are we? You know, what, what wants to be expressed through us? And then by the end of the course, we are stepping out and being that. Hopefully, you know, we, we have the opportunity. And um, so we're at the end of, uh, we're, the, we're a live course. And we're... Uh, going into week eight, um, the last of the eight weeks tomorrow. And um, it's been just a really powerful experience for us all. And um, we're very excited about bringing something live and really getting to examine our, ourselves at a very, very deep level. Walter, what would you add? Walter's my beloved partner in everything. Nothing. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, we look, look forward to doing it again, too, as well. So thanks. Yeah, we look forward to the opportunity to bring it back. It's and then, thanks. And then Sharon. Yes. You talked about a little about yours, too. So if you want to add anything, please go ahead. Yes, I'm mindful of, of Barbara Marks Hubbard, her exhortation to us to take the full implications out of our potential very seriously. That... Uh, Exhortation, this feels like it's been amplified in recent times because of, of current events. And I feel like we, we all have our own individual potential that is our evolutionary impulse that's wanting to be actualized because it's part of the puzzle of what we're grappling with. And my, my program, which is based on my book by the same name, Activate Your Female Power, is really written... As a, as a guidebook for women to come home to the terra firma that we live in, which is our bodies. You know, so much of the, the cultural narrative about the female body is that it's defective and, and flawed and destined to malfunction and that whole thing. And what I discovered in my doing my detailed study of the female body is that it's an inexhaustible source of wonder and inspiration. There are so many miracles that go on right here inside our bodies. And when I discovered that, it lit me up with a kind of a spiritual fire in my heart. And then I had the awareness that the female body is the home or the repository of an exceptional form of spiritual power. 
and that when we connect with that, it can transform and become laser focused into a, a, what I would describe as a biological leadership, which is protective of all life. Mm. So my course is, is the guided tour into that step by step. There are seven downloadable meditations. So I, in each module, I talk about different aspects of the female body and the, the miracles that go on there. And then, then at the end, I do a, um, a guided meditation so that all of that information can land and transform and light up and activate that dormant potential that Robert was talking about. In my shamanic tradition, we have this uh, description is our DNA, our RNA and our ETA and our ETA is our evolutionary transformational agent. It's there waiting to be switched on and so my program's focus is to do exactly that, to switch on that ETA inside an individual woman's body regardless of where she is in her life cycle, regardless of whether she's had children or no, just simply the fact of being embodied in this female form carries a huge amount of of wealth and resource and wonder and beauty and I really want to light that up in women and my I guess my goal and my dream is to create a global network of women who are living a dedicated commitment to the sacredness of their bodies because I feel like that has the potential to shift the balance back into male female harmony and a partnership model of social organization so that's my big vision okay. thank, so thank you, you. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we're at the end of our time. Uh, we hope to do this again and make this part of a series called Permutations, uh, and we'll, we'll explore different topics around uh, uh, conscious evolution in each of these. So uh, thanks so much, everyone on the panel, and thanks so much, everyone who joined us as an attendee. We're really grateful for your questions, your, for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again. I will send out a link to the recording of this as well. So if you missed part of it or if you just want to see it again, uh, you'll, you'll get to see the recording. So thanks so much, everyone. Peace. Peace. Thank you. Thanks.